Good morning, dobre jutro, namaskar and salam alaikum. It's a special pleasure to give this lecture to you. And you see on my title slide, I always show the oil price. The oil prices are, this is month, one month, okay? So what you see is for one month. Uh, also, I am showing you a history of the Kern River steam flood. The, this lecture is on steam injection. Steam injection is the most successful EOR method. Where, how do we define success? Success is making money, whether it's profitable. So that's what we have. So in, you see the production history of the current river field. This is barrels per day on the y-axis and uh, the time here. And you see the initial production by primary and the steam production, which is this yellow yellow area, as you can see. Okay, so let's uh, proceed. <clears throat> a little bit of a history. <clears throat> it uh, may interest you that I designed the first steam flood in 1963 in the Bradford oil field, which is only a five centipoise oil. So why would we do that? because steam is particularly good if you have a viscous oil and the oil viscosity is reduced by heat. However, we did a great deal of experimental work in the lab and we found that we could just distill the oil 100% by steam, a light oil, especially this Bradford oil. And so we, uh, the people there uh, decided to uh, do this uh, steam flood in the lab uh, I'm sorry, in the field, and uh, we found that after the water flood, where we started the steam flood, we were able to recover 18% of the oil. Now, this is 1963. That was a long time ago. Uh, we had very little understanding of steam, but uh, I, I thought it was successful. It was not economic, obviously, because at that time, the oil price was... $1.10 a barrel for the West Texas crude and $4 for the Pennsylvania crude where I was. And at that time, the Kuwait crude was, what do you know, the 59 cents a barrel, 59 cents a barrel. Also, you see my book. This was published in 1970. And if you, uh, it's, it's impossible to get it. And it's not worth uh, getting it anyway, because this is now old. Uh, and uh, if you open the book, you'll see that the price is seven dollars. I have only one copy left now. Uh, okay, so let's get back to the st steam injection. The steam injection can take several forms. There are actually more than that, uh, but uh, I'll show you uh, all that in a minute. What does the steam do in general? If you have a heavy oil reservoir, and there are many heavy oil reservoirs in the world, I'll show you in a minute. Steam lowers the heavy oil. Heavy, heavy. you see, heavy means really viscous. Uh, it will lower the viscosity of the heavy oil by maybe 1,000 times. So if the oil viscosity was 2,000, it will be maybe one centipoise at the steam temperature of only maybe 400 Fahrenheit, which is about 205 degrees C. That's one thing. However, if you have a light oil, as, as you just saw a minute ago, steam can still distill the light ends. In fact, it can distill 100% of the light oil. But the only question then will be, do you have enough oil after the water flood to justify steam injection and the cost? Now, there have been something like 35 light oil steam floods and several thousand heavy oil steam floods right now. Maybe there are several hundred steam floods in, in operation at the moment. I've worked on steam floods, actual field projects where I've actually gone to the field in many countries, especially, of course, California and Canada, and also in Brazil, Argentina, Venezuela, uh, Trinidad, uh, Colombia, uh, Japan. Japan has some heavy oil too. China, uh, Indonesia, and still many other countries. 
Uh, so I've seen many steam floods and I've designed also many, starting with the first one in 1963 that you just saw. Now, of all the EOR processes, steam injection has several forms. And the main thing is this, that steam injection can be adapted to almost any reservoir. You show me a reservoir and the chances are 99% that I can come with a steam injection process that will work there. Right now, the total production in the world by steam injection is 2 million barrels a day, maybe more. Uh, we don't know the exact numbers recently, but uh, that's how it is. Right now in the United States, we are producing 300,000 barrels a day by steam injection. And in Canada, we are producing more than a million barrels a day by steam injection. Now, there are many recovery methods. And you see, I have uh, blanked out some of them. The main thing to remember is that there, there are all these recovery methods, but very few are commercially successful. I keep repeating it. Commercial success is the most important single criterion. Of course, we want to learn about the process. We want to re do research. And if you want to do that, then every, everything's okay. Uh, but if you want to make money, there are very few methods which have been really successful. Now, among the thermal methods, you see thermal methods you see here, we have hot water injection, steam injection, in situ combustion, which is the subject of our next lecture, and electrical heating. We're not going to talk about those today. <clears throat> we'll only look at the thermal methods and there too, CSS, cyclic steam stimulation, steam flooding, SEC-D, which is steam-assisted gravity drainage, and maybe a couple of words about conduction heating. And so that is essentially our today, today's topic. Now, if you look at a bigger table of uh, EOR classification, uh, if, for example, in some of the Russian books, they even include atomic nuclear explosions and things like that. Uh, but we are looking at only the methods which have been successful in the field and a couple of other methods too, which have not been successful in the field. Uh, in the case of a steam, let me put it this way, that if you do a steam injection, is, and if you do it at all reasonably well, you cannot lose money. These are the thermal heavy oil recovery methods, steam flooding. A steam flooding essentially means we are injecting steam continuously into a reservoir, and there are many variations. Hot water flooding is also one of them. Steam-assisted gravity drainage, steam-assisted gas oil gravity drainage, and still others. As I say that today we can adopt a steam, adapt a steam to almost any reservoir conditions. Typical recovery factors that we have in the field are in the range of 50, 60 percent, sometimes less too. But uh, we have some fields which we have recovered 75 percent of the oil in the field. So steam has, uh, has been very effective. Uh, the highest recovery I've seen in San Ardo field in California. I worked on just about all the California oil field. And there the recovery factor uh, last I saw was 83% of the oil in the, in the field. Okay, another form of steam injection is cyclic steam stimulation. Sometimes it is used together with steam flooding, but sometimes it is used by itself. And cyclic steam stimulation has two forms. Non-frac, which means that we're injecting steam below fracking pressure. And the oil recovery in that case is 10 to 40%. Most of the time it's in the around 10, 15% range. And also we have some cases as in Canada, where we are injecting steam above frac pressures. In other words, we are fracking the formation with the steam. And we'll see that in a minute. Other recovery methods, we'll see next time in situ combustion. In situ combustion has not been particularly successful in an economic sense, although we have done many steam in situ combustion projects. And the last one you see is electrical heating. I have worked on several biggest electrical heating projects. They have not been commercially successful. They have some serious problems 
and uh, we don't have time today to discuss them. Now, first of all, uh, what kind of oil reserves and resources do we have? We have light oil reserves. You can see worldwide, supposedly we have 1,500 billion barrels. Which this means 1.5 trillion. In the United States, uh, our current reserves are at least 46 billion barrels, maybe much more. Uh, we have shale oil and uh, we have we are producing now 14 million barrels a day. Canada is about 180 billion. These are a billion barrels, 10 to 9, okay? Billion has a little different definition in South America. Uh, Venezuela has about 87 billion. These are light oil, remember light oil. And some of the light oils can be flooded also by steam. Saudi Arabia has 264. The recovery factor for the light oils is about roughly worldwide, you could say, one third, 33 percent, but it varies widely from field to field. Now, when we talk about the steam injection and uh, other thermal methods, our target is the heavy oil and tar sand resources. So how much heavy oil and tar sand resources do we have in the world? Maybe five trillion at least, maybe eight trillion. We really don't have exact numbers. I would say that our heavy oil resources are close to 8 trillion. Now, uh, we still have an awful lot of oil to be discovered. You look at Russia, Russia is a very, very large country. It has 11 time zones. Did you know that? And Russia has hardly been explored. And then, then we have the Arctic islands in Canada and the Arctic in Russia. And they're drilling the wells there. So currently we have fossil fuels, in my opinion, enough for a thousand years, maybe much more. This includes also gas hydrates. Okay, so the, if you look at the heavy oil in the world, the largest resources are in the USA, uh, Canada, Venezuela, and Saudi Arabia has a lot of heavy oil, which they haven't even charged it. What is the recovery factor currently? maybe 10 percent overall maybe much less but we'll recover all the soil uh, most of the soil in time so we have a real good target for steam injection especially now we need to know a few rock and fluid properties before you can dis discuss steam injection and i'll show you a very simple simplified calculation also there are many rock properties that we need to know, but most important rock and fluid properties is viscosity, oil viscosity. Then rock heat capacity, how much heat you need to heat the rock. Then thermal conductivity, which is essentially how quickly the heat will flow through the rock. And thermal diffusivity is a combination of rock heat capacity and thermal conductivity. So let's look at those. First, look at the viscosity temperature behavior. So on this graph, what you see is viscosity on this y-axis and temperature in degree Fahrenheit or degree C. This is degree Fahrenheit, okay? This is degree C. And you see graphs for some of the large heavy oil reservoirs. Uh, Athabasca is a tar sand. Hobo, J-O-B-O, -O, Hobo is Venezuela. Uh, is an, uh, is a heavy oil reservoir. And then the Kern River is uh, the picture you saw on the title slide was Kern River. This is my favorite reservoir in California. The red circle show the reservoir temperature. Remember the, the temperature is on the X axis. So take one example, take Cold Lake, for example, uh, take current river. Current river, uh, current river is this graph A here. This is current river. So current river oil viscosity at the reservoir temperature, which is about uh, uh, 100 degree Fahrenheit, uh, is about here. The viscosity of current river oil is about 2,000 centipoles. If you increase the temperature to about 400 degree Fahrenheit, which will be out here, the viscosity is less than one centipoise. So that's how it is. Those lines 
uh, show you the viscosity, temperature relationship for different oils. And the important thing is this, that if you go to 400 Fahrenheit, which is 400 Fahrenheit is this here. At 400 Fahrenheit, if you extend the graphs, all the viscosities are below 10 centiboys. This is 10 centiboys. At reservoir condition, the viscosities are in thousands of centiboys and millions of centiboys. Athabasca is a tarsan, millions of centiboys. Here you see some typical lab data. A lab data, for example, for the Athabasca vitamin, at 8 degree Fahrenheit, which is 25 degrees C, the viscosity is half a million centiboys. At 400 degree Fahrenheit, which is 205 degrees C, the viscosity is only 12 centiboys. And then you have a Canadian heavy oil at 80 Fahrenheit, is 1260 centiboys. Very viscous, with more viscous than pancake syrup. This is like pancake syrup. Uh, 550 centipoise is much like uh, chocolate, uh, which is slightly softened. So this Canadian heavy oil at 400 degree Fahrenheit is only one centipoise. We use this oil in all of our lab experiments. We've done a lot of lab work, and I have also worked on more than 200 field projects of steam injection, and I've designed many. So I have, I'm quite familiar with how steam works in different types of reservoirs. Now, how do you reduce oil viscosity? This is Darcy equation. You've seen Darcy equation, the simplest form. This is Darcy equation. Q is the, is the oil flow rate or oil flow rate of the fluid. Mu is the viscosity. So uh, in the case of a heavy oil, the viscosity is thousands of centipoise. And so Q is very small. If you can lower the viscosity by 1,000 times to one centipoise, you can see Q will be 1,000 times bigger. Well, it's not quite 1,000 times bigger because there is water also. So it's, but it still is much, much larger than the original oil viscosity uh, will give you. Uh, the rate will be one, two barrels a day. And now if you heat the oil, the, the oil flow rate will be thousands of barrels a day. So this is the way to do it. Increase the temperature. Now there are other ways too in the literature you see that you mix a solvent with heavy oil. I've worked on it for many, many years. You see, I, I worked on a steam for oh, well over more than 60 years now. And I've worked with solvents too for almost the same length of time. And indeed, a solvent will lower the oil viscosity, but it's first of all, is very expensive, but much more important, solvent is very difficult to mix with the oil in the porous medium, uh, but people keep doing it. It's still another idea for lowering the oil viscosity is to emulsify the heavy oil. Not a good idea. Don't do it. And solvent too, before you use it, look at the literature carefully. The real simple and effective way of lowering oil viscosity is to heat the oil. And the best heating medium is steam. Now, a couple of rock properties are very important to know. Uh, they may be a little boring for you, but uh, you must know them. I'll show you a little calculation too. If you have a typical rock, then you need 36 BTUs for to heat each cubic foot of the rock bulk volume by one degree Fahrenheit. Or if you are working in SI unit, 2,500 kilojoules for one cubic meters to heat by one degree C. Now, the main thing is this, that when you're heating the rock, 75% of the heat is going to heat the rock matrix. So after you have removed all the oil by steam injection or whatever other process, a great deal of the injected heat is still there in the raw grains. And you should try to come up with a way to utilize it. And we have some ways of doing it. Thermal conductivity of rock is the heat transferred in one second per square meter in a one meter distance for a one degree C temperature difference. And typical thermal conductivity is two times 10 to the minus th three kilowatts per meter per degree C. In uh, British units, it, uh, the, uh, the thermal conduct conductivity will be the heat transfer in BTUs 
in one hour in one square foot area or one degree temperature Fahrenheit uh, temperature difference over one foot. And a typical value will be 1.2 BTUs per hour per foot per degree Fahrenheit. Thermal diffusivity is KH over MS and uh, it enters into many calculations. But the main thing to remember is reservoir heat capacity MS, which is 36 in British units and 2,500 in SI units. Steam is the best heat carrier. In other words, if you want to transfer heat to the reservoir, nothing comes close to steam. Steam has the highest enthalpy of liquid, which we call also sensible heat. It has also the highest enthalpy of vaporization, which we call also latent heat. So one pound of steam can carry more heat than any other substance. Now, here's an interesting number. A one kiloton nuclear detonation releases 0.4 to 10 to the 10 kilojoules. And that is equal to the heat we inject in about 15 days if you're doing a steam injection. Can you believe that? You know, the nuclear detonations, Hiroshima was, Hiroshima was 10 kilotons. Okay, Nagasaki in Japan, in the World War II was 11 kilotons. I was quite small at the time, but I, I remember that uh, my father told me that there was a nuclear de detonation in Japan and it killed each of them. He, he said uh, half a million people. He said five lakh uh, people in Hindi terminology. So the amount of heat you release by steam injection is gigantic. And you can see this number, you can convert your heat injection into kilotons of nuclear detonation. And would you believe that in Russia, there have been 129 nuclear detonations in Russia in heavy oil reservoirs. And none of them produced any oil to speak of, but they called a lot of contamination. I, and I got this number from the person who wrote the last report on these, Dr. Barin Balat. Now you can get the properties of steam from uh, steam tables or mathematical equations. Here are some simple equations and uh, portion of steam table. If you are in my class in the university, I give everybody cards like this. On the card on one side, you have all the properties given in SI units. On the other side in British units, and down below you have simple equation that you can use. So what does this car show you? Let's uh, look at the British units. I work with both, okay. So let's take this, uh, this one here. This says that 100 PSI steam will have a temperature of 327.8 degree Fahrenheit. It will have a volume, a volume of the water in the, if you have a water at that temperature, it will be 0 0.01744 cubic feet for one pound of water. If you have a steam at that pressure and temperature, it will have a volume of 4.431 cubic feet for one pound of steam. The enthalpy of liquid water, in other words, will be 298.5 BTUs for one pound, and the enthalpy of vaporization of water will be 883.6 BTUs per pound. So I've written uh, some of the chosen pressures. Now you can find steam tables uh, there on the internet and you can buy them. A lot of them are available. And this uh, uh, upper table gives you the same numbers in the SI units. Uh, most of the time we are operating with the steam flares in this range. But in Core Lake, we are at higher uh, temperatures also. And look at the equation. These are very simple equations. I derived these equations oh, in 1964. And the reason they are so simple is that they are for slide rule use. You probably don't know what a slide rule is. They were very useful. And now the two numbers that are most important to us are HW, the enthalpy of liquid, which is boiling water and the enthalpy of water when it changes into steam. 
Now, if you look at the LV, the red graph, you can see that as the pressure goes from zero to 3,208 PSI, which is the critical pressure, the LV goes to zero. HW, on the other hand, goes up. Now, LV, the latent heat of steam, is the key to recovery. You want to create a steam chamber or a steam zone or a steam chest. You hear all those words, okay? So a steam zone is the part of the reservoir which is where the temperature of steam is TS. Now, if I were to plot the temperature of steam, it will look like this. This last point will be 3,208 uh, or 705 uh, degree C. Uh, now, in general, if you see the projects in California, Venezuela, and Cold Lake, I mean, there are projects all over the world, steam projects, but in California or in Alberta, SAGD projects, they operate around 300 PSI. In Venezuela, maybe some of you are from Venezuela, I have a long relation with Venezuela. I've been to Venezuela hundreds of times, literally from 1965. And the last time I went there was 2008. Uh, so Venezuela has gigantic oil resources. Uh, there, the operating pressure is around uh, 600 psi, uh, 5 MPa. Core Lake, the operating pressure is around 10 MPa megapascal, or 1500 psi. Why those pressure are chosen? Well, because of the reservoir conditions. Now, I should also make a quick comment, very quick comment on non-thermal heavy oil recovery methods. Now, people keep doing water flooding. Water flooding in California and not too viscous oils and also in Saskatchewan and Canada has been economically, economically successful, although recovery factors only three, four, five percent. It's not very effective, but it is economical because you're injecting water. Most of the oil, 95% of the oil is left in the reservoir. Now, people have done polymer flooding, surfactant flooding, alkaline flooding, invisible CO2, solvent flooding. All those methods have been used in heavy oil. And trust me, they don't, they, they don't work. They don't, they're not economical. Don't waste your time doing any chemical floods in heavy oil reservoirs. Now, how does uh, hot water or steam heat the reservoir? The two things are vastly different. If you're injecting hot water, the only way hot water will give you, it will heat the reservoir is by heating the reservoir by cooling of the water. In other words, it gives up enthalpy of liquid and uh, that enthalpy of liquid is about 40%, less than half of that of the steam for the same weight and for the same reservoir temperature and for the same steam or hot water temperature. Hot water, it says here, supplies heat through a drop in temperature. Steam supplies heat through a drop in steam quality. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the temperature remains constant. This is a very important factor. If you are injecting steam, it will create a hot zone or a steam chamber or a steam chest. All those words are used. We shall have a constant temperature. That is the key. Now, it says here, steam creates a constant temperature region where there's the hot water zone. Uh, hot water will produce a steady temperature variation. Okay, you see that in the recovery. Now let's take a steam flooding first. Now we have very little time. We have several processes to discuss. A steam flood works on a pattern basis. So the pattern is like this already. I mean, I should have drawn it like this. Uh, it's, it is repeated. In other words, I should have drawn these lines like that. But a typical pattern is what you see, this is square here. This is a five spot pattern. We have also other pattern, seven is part, nine is part. We don't have time to discuss those. But for the five spot pattern, what you see in the middle is a steam injection well, and four 
producing wells. Actually, if you have a repeated pattern, there's only one producing well because you have only a quarter well here. One quarter well, one quarter well, one quarter well. Now, if you take a cross section, draw, uh, draw a cross section on that dotted line, it looks like what I show you in this picture. The steam injection well, which is the middle well, center well, and at, uh, uh, at the corner, the corner well is shown here. This is the producing well. So you see, we are injecting steam in the lower part of the well. We have to inject. That takes a lot of experience. And also, we have to look at the geology. So as we inject the steam, steam will rise quickly to the top. I, I told you this before, too, that light fluids go up, heavy fluids go down. Right? That's the most useful thing I can tell you. Amazingly, a lot of people don't pay attention to that. So steam will go up right away. Now, it will depend also on the geology. Maybe you will shale here. But in general, in California, formations are very thick and they are very permeable. So steam rises to the top very quickly. And in time, it will reach the producer here. After that, what we do? Now, this is uh, we have all kinds of other ways of doing it too, but one way will be that we'll shut these pulps and the steam will be forced to go lower down here. Then we'll shut these pulps and we keep doing it until we get a very high vertical sweep. Below the steam zone, this is the steam zone here, where the steam temperature is the equal to the steam temperature at the prevailing pressure. Below the steam zone, you will have a condensate zone. Condensate is hot water, and this condensate is really going and pushing the oil into these perforations. So it's a very, very efficient process. And again, everything depends on economics. Depending on the economics, we can do lots of things to improve the performance. First of all, when the steam breaks through, we reduce the steam injection rate. We still keep the steam rate high enough so that the steam zone is still there. But we save a lot of money by cutting the steam rate. And then also uh, economics will determine how, for how long we can keep shutting these pumps. And we shut these pumps very cheaply, by the way, we'll using a balloon packer. Balloon packer. I don't know whether you heard about this. It's like the word says balloon. Uh, we just put it there in the uh, between the in the endless, and the steam blows it up and shuts off the steam. So these are some of the operational details. Uh, we don't have time for that. In general, the steam uh, any steam process has a very poor heat balance. You see, we, uh, what I'm showing you here is it from an actual project. Peace River in Canada. So imagine that we are injecting 100% of the heat. What is this heat? Well, it's a steam, but we are really burning gas. Typically, we burn gas, we can burn lots of other things. We have even burned coal. Uh, we, we can burn the produced oil. But in general, because gas is very cheap right now in the United States, we are burning gas here. And we're losing 25% of the heat right at the steam generator. Then we are losing another 3 to 5% of the heat in the piping. Then 10% in the well board. And then when the steam goes into the formation, we're losing 20% of that original heat to the formations above and below. I mean, if this is hot and this is cold, heat will go into the cold formation. And same goes below. And we are also producing back maybe 10% of the heat. So you see a very uh, uh, poor heat balance. But that's the nature of the steam or any heat, heat process. Uh, However, we minimize the heat loss. Uh, we try to do that. And we try to utilize the heat which is going to the surrounding formation. Uh, but that's another subject. Uh, we, should, we call it heat management, how to minimize the heat loss. Now, in general, I, I can only talk about general factors of, about these processes. Steam flooding. Steam flooding 
means that we have patterns, a set pattern triangle, like water flow. We choose a suitable pattern, and uh, then after that, we stain, we inject a steam. Size of the pattern is extremely critical. Size is very critical. You cannot have too large, not too small. In current river, I'll show you some pictures of that. Our pattern sizes are one, two, five, ten acres maximum. Same in Indonesia. Indonesia is the largest steam flood, by the way. Oil recovery, as I said before, is five, 50 to 60 percent, and a typical flood will uh, go on for five to eight years, sometimes longer. First, we cycle the well. We do steam cyclic first, steam cycles, several cycles, and then we convert it to a steam flood. Mechanism of steam flood, lots of mechanisms, gravity override of steam. But the main mechanism is that the oil saturation in the steam zone is very small, 10%. So let's say you start out with 70% steam saturation, what is oil saturation? And when you do the steam flood, the oil saturation is only 10%. That is the key. So steam zone, steam chamber is the key to steam oil recovery. So there are lots of concepts which enter into steam. Patterns, type, size, mechanism, gravity versus uh, the frontal drive, vertical sweep, how to cut down the steam rate after breakthrough, and the cost of steam. Well, cost of steam is the key factor. And I'll give you a rule of thumb. You can calculate it very exa uh, exactly. Cost of steam in the US and Canada will be about, in dollars, it will be half the cost of gas, dollars per barrel of steam as water. When we talk about barrel of steam, we are talking about steam as water. So cost of one barrel of steam is half the cost of gas, if you are burning gas, per MCL. So this works in the British units. So let's say the cost of gas is one MC of gas is two dollars right now. That's about what we have in in the U.S. So cost of one barrel of steam will be one dollar. I missed my rule of thumb. Okay, uh, you can calculate that exactly. So if you are injecting four barrels of steam to recover one barrel of oil, then you are spending four dollars on gas for one barrel of oil, really low right now, but can be much higher. Uh, for example, I designed a, uh, have designed a project in Kuwait where the cost of gas is much, much higher, maybe five times higher. Now here is simple, uh, simple steam flood calculation. So here is an example that we have pattern size of five acre thickness Firstly, is given oil saturation is given reservoir temperature is given, and then we are injecting steam at 600 barrels today. The steam pressure is given, quality is given, and the steam flood residual oil saturation is given as 12 percent. Now we are assuming this is the key thing here, which simply which is the simplification. We are assuming an aerial sweep at, of 80 percent and vertical sweep of 30 percent when the steam breakthrough occurs when the steam first arrives at the well board. So what is the cumulative oil recovery and what is the steam oil ratio? Steam oil ratio is very important. How much is steam you're injecting to produce one barrel of oil? So here is the solution and we don't have time to go through the solution. It's a very simple calculation. Calculate the oil in place and then calculate how much of the volume you will have to heat, which is the bulk volume multiplied by the sweep and then you calculate the how much heat you need, and then you calculate the heat injection rate, and that will give you the time to break through. And after you know that, then given the bulk volume and the, and the porosity and the oil saturation, you are producing this much oil. This is the initial oil saturation. This is the steam flood residual. Huge reduction in the oil saturation. And so our answer is, at breakthrough steam, we have recovered 20% of the oil, and our steam oil ratio at that time is 1.6 steam barrels for one barrel of oil. 
So this is simplified. Now, if you do a comprehensive calculation, I have developed several methods uh, which are in my papers and books and so on, and others also. Uh, but the key assumptions, aerial sway, vertical sway, heat loss, those are the things that you calculate in the more detailed methods. Our experience with the steam in California, Brazil, Venezuela, Indonesia, and many other countries is excellent. In California, we are producing over 300,000 barrels a day at a steam oil ratio of, of four, which is now going up a little bit. It's very, very profitable because our steam costs only a dollar a barrel. So maybe we're injecting four barrels, four dollars for the steam costs and other costs. And our oil price is 50. You know, the California heavy oil sells actually even a little higher than the light oil in Texas. And the reason is the California refineries are geared for heavy oil. Now, steam has also been uh, very successful in Canada in light oils as well as in uh, uh, heavy oils and also in other countries. Uh, has not, steam fed as such has not been successful in oil sand, oil sand, tar sand, they call them in other countries, because the oil viscosity is extremely high. But we have another steam process which has been very successful in tar sand. But again, as I said in the beginning, we can adapt steam flooding for almost any kind of reservoir. You give me a reservoir and I'll come with a steam process for you. A special case of steam flooding, which, which is like a special reservoir. Thin formations. Thin means less than 30 feet or 10 meters. Light oil reservoirs. Well, the first steam flood I designed as a told you in 1963 was the light oil. Using horizontal wells, using additives, or before in situ combustion. All those things have been done and they can be profitable depending on the reservoir. Many steam additives have been used. In other words, you're injecting steam and injecting some gas foam or some liquid, including solvent, even solids. And trust me, none of them is profitable. You can do that. And oh, we've done hundreds of projects using additives, okay? I have a lot of experience with additives. None of them has ever given us, given us a profitable uh, oil recovery. But I, I have to mention those, okay? Okay. Steam oil ratio, we mentioned it's a very important number. This is the volume of the steam injected per unit volume of the oil recovery. Limiting steam oil ratio, imagine that you're injecting steam and you're burning all of the produced oil to generate that steam. In other words, you're not making any money. It's, uh, it's just... Uh, uh, you could say break even in, by way of volume. That is 14. So if you are operating a project at a steam oil ratio 14, is definitely not profitable. But we we can get around that too. We can use coal, and then we can go to even higher than 14. We have done that in California. Now, right now, I don't know if any coal-fired steam generators. The steam oil ratio in California is one to two uh, for cyclic. Uh, in Alberta, is two to four, five. And amazingly, it's extremely low in Venezuela. In Venezuela, the steam flood oil is almost free. Cyclic steam stimulation, really, they do. And they, they have amazingly low steam oil ratio. In other words, they are injecting less than half a barrel of steam to produce one barrel of oil. Now that's another story. Uh, steam flooding, on the other hand, the uh, SOR is greater than four, maybe five, even six, but they are all very profitable. Indonesia is the is the most profitable area. This uh, big Turi, Turi is the name of the field. I've been there. This is near, near where the tsunami hit. So I have to go a little bit more quickly. 
uh, it's, it's a very profitable flood. Current river is the, uh, I call it the dream oil reservoir. Everything is just right. Now, I don't have time to read all this. I've given you all the data on this, key data. Oil viscosity is 1,000 to 4,000. And the oil recovery factor right now is as high as 75% the field. But they have, they're drilling oils. You see, here's a picture of the field. It's heavily developed. Uh, this gives you an idea how close the wells are. Because we are operating on one acre spacing, two acre spacing, two and a half acre, five acres. Why? Because it's a shallow reservoir. It cost maybe $200,000 to complete complete uh, a well, complete with the uh, beam pump. So it's very, very profitable. Here's the history of the current river field. Uh, well, you saw the history of the current river field in the very first slide. This is the steam power. And now it's uh, declining, everything declines. Uh, but if you see the very first slide, let me quickly show you that. Uh, you can see the in in incredible, you see here's the current river field. The primary production is this small curve, and this is the steam production. So it has been extremely successful uh, in current river. And also in other uh, California floods, the steam has been very successful. Now there's a modified steam drive in Oman. I've done a lot of work in Oman. And this is the current alum field in Oman. Uh, where it has been, the steam has been very successful, and there are still floods. There is another field, Mukhesna uh, in Oman also, and I have designed that flood also. Cyclic steam stimulation is a different kind of process. It's a single well process, really. So imagine that we have a single well. We are injecting steam, then we are shutting in the well for a while, then we are producing the well. So all you have is one well. But of course, we have many wells. And so what happens is that after a while, you produce it. When you produce the well, it produces a very high rate. But after a while, it goes down. And then you repeat it. Keep doing it again and again. And the steam flood uh, will be the final stage of the project. There are many uh, mechanisms which drive the oil in a uh, cyclic. Uh, I've written gravity, rock, rock fluid expansion, and so forth. In Core Lake, the cyclic, this is a Core Lake, is a small city in Canada, north of Canada. Uh, and there we have a special variation of co uh, cyclic. Uh, this is the history of that uh, Core Lake project. You see, for a long time, Imperial Oil, which is a subsidiary of Exxon, they were, for 20 years, 25 years, they were producing hardly anything. They, then they hit upon the idea of actually fracturing the rock with steam. And see, their production is now 165,000 barrels a day, 150,000 kilo barrels a day. Very successful project. And the idea is this, that we are injecting steam into not one well, we are injecting steam into 15 wells at a time, so that they all frack and they are all connected by one fracture. And after that, we control the fractures, and this, it becomes like a steam drive with the fractures that are driving wells, you could see. Here's a picture of the uh, aerial view of the Coal Lake project. And the, what you see in the picture is only about a tenth of the total area. And we do also 4D seismic there. This is 4D seismic, you probably know that we have all the geophones and the acoustic devices there in the field. And then we repeat the survey every, let's say every month, every two months and so forth. This is a typical production history. So initially the, you can see red color is the steam and the down below black color is the produced oil. And remember this is 200 cubic meters a day. So it's a, huge scale. So it's 1,200 barrels a day, this this peak, black peak here. So with the cycles, you can see they can do up to 17 cycles at the moment. They'll go up to 50 cycles. Can you believe that? Uh, this And now we have the SAG-D. Uh, we have uh, uh, SAG-D is a rather special process. 
completely different from what we have talked about. Uh, in sec D, what we are doing is this. You see from these pictures that we are initially injecting steam into, into two wells. The two wells are on top, on top of each other. I should have shown you this. This is the top well. This is the bottom well. These are both horizontal wells, 1,000 meter long. More than almost a mile long. And then after that, we are injecting steam in the top well. The steam rises. And during uh, here, you have the production rate. This is the production rate. And this is time t. So initially, the steam rises. And you have this production. It builds up to a constant rate. And then after that, the steam expands sideways, which you see in this middle portion, at a constant rate. And at a later time, the steam starts to interfere with surrounding wells, and the production rate goes down. So, so this is uh, the same picture that I showed you before, uh, essentially cross-sectional view. Remember, this is a cross-section. This is the top of the formation. This is the base of the formation. And the steam chamber looks like this when it is fully developed. Uh, a lot of people have worked on it. The latest work is uh, by one of the students, Arga, and it's in the SPE paper, where we have new models. Uh, the original work was done by Butler, a very good friend of mine, Dr. Butler, McNabb, and Lowe worked on it initially in 1981. Uh, we have now... Uh, 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 improved the equations and so forth. Operation, initially we heat the wells by circulating the wells and then after that we are operating and then we have a mature project. That's where we are now in many of the fields. Uh, this is the sec D equation and again we have corrected this equation and if you want to see the latest, take a look at the paper. Uh, these are the different results. Here is the performance of the different projects by SAG D. And you can see that we are producing about a million barrels a day from 1,500 well pairs. So imagine you have wells on the top and at the bottom. We're injecting steam. They are five meters apart. And we have 1,500 of those. And we are producing about a million barrels a day. So it's amazing success. And uh, some of the projects are expanding, some of, the, some of them are winding down, and so forth. These are typical criteria for the success of SAG-D. Very high vertical permeability, very high oil viscosity, you know? High oil viscosity because you want to seal the steam chamber. The steam is rising, you want to seal it by the oil viscosity. If you have a lighter oil, the steam will go all over the place and also very high permeability and then some lesser criteria. Sag D operation we already talked about. Vapex is a variation of Sag D using a solid. It doesn't work. Don't waste your money, but I have to mention it. Steam, because we are injecting gigantic amounts of steam, the surface the surface of that area rises. Right now, the surface maximum Heave, which means the lifting of the heave is one foot, 25, 30 centimeters. And then for my final observations, first of all, steam is a highly effective oil recovery method for heavy oils and also for light oils. In the case of light oils, you have to be a little bit careful. Is there enough oil in place? Because we have already water flooded the oil. So is there enough oil to justify the project? Cyclic steaming is a very general process and you can combine it with steam flooding. In Venezuela, in cold lakes, cyclic steaming is a process by itself because those reservoirs are either not economical for steam flooding or they're not suitable technically for steam flooding. That's a big subject in itself. And finally, as I said before, steam injection can be adapted for almost any type of reservoir. You give me a reservoir and I can come up with a process using steam. 
A good example is SAG D. Nobody ever thought that we could recover oil from a tar sand with the steam, but we are. So that's all. Thank you very much.